Welcome to Why Flannery O'Connor Matters, a conversation with documentary filmmakers, Father Mark Bosco and Dr. Elizabeth Kaufman, hosted by the Office of Mission and Ministry and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for this discussion. Our moderator, Father Michael Garanzini, is the president of the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities he is a, a Jesuit of the Central and Southern Province in the United States and is also the Secretary for Higher Education for the Society of Jesus. He was president of Loyola University of Chicago from 2001 to 2014, then chancellor of the university from 2014 to 2017. It was at Loyola Chicago that Father Garanzini worked with Father Mark Bosco and Dr. Elizabeth Kaufman as they launched the film project Flannery. Father Garanzini has been co-trustee of the Mary Flannery O'Connor Charitable Trust since 1998. At Georgetown, Father Garanzini served as special assistant to the president and acting chair of the psychology department from 1998 to 2001. I'm Kelly Young, associate director of strategic engagement in alumni relations, and I'll be facilitating tonight's webinar. As a quick reminder, this session is being recorded and the recording will be shared via a follow-up email. You may also use the question section of your webinar control panel to submit questions for Father Mark and Elizabeth. Without any further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Father Michael Garanzini. Thank you, Kelly. Um, it's good to see you, Father Mark and Dr. Elizabeth. Um, great to see you again. Um, let's just dive right in to talking about the film. Uh, so I want to ask you uh, how it all began. Where, how did this project begin? I know a little bit about how it began because I was with you at Loyola, but uh, tell me your own story about where this all starts. Sure, I think I go first, right, Elizabeth, and then you, okay. Right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, was, I was always interested in Flannery O'Connor teaching, you know, Catholic literary modernism, teaching kind of the great uh, Catholic authors of the 20th century. So she was always part of my repertoire, but I wouldn't say I really dove into the scholarship until a, around 2000 as I was finishing up with this Graham Greene. So I was working on Graham Greene in 2008, uh, and I was staying with a, a mutual friend of ours, Chris O'Hare, and he he showed me all the transcripts and gave me all the transcripts that he had done of a, of, uh, of, of, of interviews with of people who knew Flannery O'Connor. And I kept those, and he says, you know, you guys can have the tapes and all that stuff. I don't I think I can do anything with it. I went back, I still had other projects to do, and so we kind of sat on it. You know all about that, Father Garanzini, because um, uh, you, helped, you helped also procure the tapes uh, to get them to Loyola. Um, but really it was, so that, I, I knew we had something there just reading through the transcripts. I was using those transcripts for my own research. And in 2011, we did a, a conference on Flannery O'Connor held in Chicago. And I went to Elizabeth. Elizabeth showed up at, I think, the year after I did at, uh, at, at Chicago. So we were kind of new faculty. Um, she was in communications and I knew she was a documentarian. So I said, Elizabeth, will you just help me just videotape some of the folks that are going to be at this because there's going to be her cousins and, and scholars and maybe we can get some interviews. Maybe we can do a movie. And she, you know, Elizabeth was, yeah, I'll help you. But she's a little bit kind of, you know, standoffish. Oh, let's do a film. Um, and then uh, and so we she, that's how we kind of started. And then Really, I think it was like the next year that we just started sitting down with what, what we saw from Chris's um, 14 hours of tapes, uh, tape that we know we knew maybe we had a real story because that became the backbone of it. So I'll let Elizabeth take it away from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Elizabeth, yeah, how did you get into this? Certainly, Besides well. Besides being roped into it by Mark. <laughs> well, that was the first stage, being roped into it as, you know, films are a lot of work and cost a lot of money. And so, you know, when, when Mark first approached me many years ago, uh, it really had that, can you help me out with the conference? And there's some interesting people coming and we just want to videotape it. And, you know, so it's like, okay, sure. Uh, but, you know, having O'Connor's cousin show up and uh, some good friends. I already knew that was uh, an interesting setup. However, I didn't really know that we had a real project until uh, Mark showed me uh, Chris O'Hare's earlier interviews that were in a closet somewhere. And I took a look at these, these interviews and saw how great they were uh, with people who uh, were already passed. Uh, uh, editor Sally Fitzgerald, publisher Bob Giroux, 
and then combining those early interviews with what um, now Mark, I think, knows he is a natural film producer. Uh, his great instincts for um, beyond the conference, Mark would just like, hey, I got uh, Brad Gooch, writer, biographer. I got, uh, I, can, I think I can get Alice Walker. Um, Hilton, Hilton Alls. <laughs> so this was no big deal uh, for Mark, but once we entered that category and I, I saw these earlier videotapes, I had a feeling we had an, an NEH project, a National Endowment for the Humanities project on our hand, as well as it from the very beginning, we had American masters as our goal yeah. and um, started approaching them. That's terrific. Um, tell me in this process of getting these people to comment on Flannery and explain their love for Flannery, what they thought was important about Flannery. Did, did anything surprise you uh, as you're working with some very talented people? Uh, you didn't have a chance to talk to all the people that Chris had, had filmed, but, and some of them had already passed away, as you said, but, but you had all these new folks that, uh, any, did any of them surprise you? Um, you know, I was, I was, I have to say, I was really surprised that Brad Gooch speaks in paragraphs. I mean, you just put him on and he just gave this great narrative. You could just tell that the biography that he wrote was really living inside of him and he could do it. So that was, a, I mean, I was just like, whoa, I mean, you know, it was really quite good. I also thought that um, I really loved Hilton Owls. I He just... He was such a generous person. I have to say, really, all all of our interviewers were were just generous. They they they, they told you why they loved Flannery O'Connor. They were happy to um, to to read from her work. Um, uh, so I'm not sure if so much surprises as as just the fact that people even even uh, Elizabeth getting Mary Steenburgen. I mean, such such generosity. Uh, all about Flannery. Oh sure, I love Flannery. So let's do it. So that was one of the things I think. Um, and just, and just having to cross the country, you know, while we're teaching full time and, you know, trying to do all these things on our Saturdays and Sundays or our, our summers to get this done. But it was really cool. What do you think, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, what do you think? Well, if anything, and I think, Mark, you're suggesting it, one of the challenges <clears throat> with the documentary, you know, we have journalistic goals on <clears throat> hand. So we want to know the good, the bad and the ugly and have our subjects talk about it. Uh, so it took some work to truly find, uh, to get to subjects to talk about the um, some of the more negative sides or some of the um, questionable letters or uh, nonfiction things uh, with O'Connor. But, but again, I think the subjects, um, once we pushed a little bit, um, we did get what Mark and I both thought were very fair assessments of, um, of O'Connor's, not just her fiction and her creative writing, but her nonfiction work too. Great, great. You know, um, you, um, you've had a very successful film. You've received awards for it, uh, many awards. You could list them all if you'd like <laughs> for us, but, uh, but I'd really like to get into <clears throat> why do you think, other than the quality, <laughs> Elizabeth, of the production and the storyline, Mark, why do you think this film garnered this much attention and was was um, so so important for people that they they nominated for prizes, they brought you around the country to speak at different events and so on? What is it about the Flannery story that you think is so important today? Why is it striking a nerve? Mark, you, do you want to start? Sure, I'll start then. Um, well, I think that. Um, I think everybody hits senses when they read an O'Connor story, even if they don't get it or they even don't maybe like it, they always sense something powerful going on. And um, and O'Connor's, one of O'Connor's stories, A Good Man's Hard to Find, is the most anthologized short story in the United States. It is found in, I have looked at every high school and college anthology of the short story. It's always in there, it, that and a couple others, but you you always have Fanny O'Connor. So so she's recognized, and so you you maybe have heard of her, and you were kind of probably excited of, uh, or kind of puzzled by it. And so this is an opportunity to kind of go back to it. So I think that's the on a, just on the level of craft and art, that's the first thing. But then when you see her life, uh, the issues of her life in America are the issues of our life 
in America. And so I, I this the sense that we're, we're continually having to come back to the questions of, of, of racism and in our, in our, as our original sin. The question of, of, of being true to your art, as a, especially as a person who's dealing with disability, um, the question of, of, of region and location, being a southerner, where are you from? Um, the question, I think, of just being a woman who's really taking it on with you know, a, a very patriarchal kind of literati that kind of exists in Boston and New York, and, and O'Connor's kind of playing with that group. I mean, they they see her greatness, and so that kind of that feminist thread as well. Um, and finally, for me, mostly, Mike, it's about her faith. I think she speaks about the the significance of of religious, you know, uh, a vision. And and you you better watch out at your own peril if you don't take it seriously because those can be often violent encounters if you are if you ignore the religious dimension of the human person and so she pushes that and I think that's just fascinating yeah Elizabeth why is she so attractive today I was gonna I mean Mark says it better than I ever could just about but I was gonna say she doesn't just speak about the religious dimension she actualizes it yeah uh, part of the you know, part of the first challenge of this film, we knew we had a great subject, a great storyteller. Um, you know, I was pretty immediately intimidated by it's like, ah, oh, we want our story of her life to be just as kind of compelling and interesting as her fiction and nonfiction are. So as creative artists ourselves, that, you know, this is part of why, you know, and I was involved in editing too just would not let the film go out until I thought that our story could, you know, start to live up to her storytelling as well. So that that was part of it. The second challenge here was, there's only the one interview of Flannery O'Connor. There's not much footage of her to make a documentary out of. And there's really, there really aren't many photographs either. Those are also limited. So, you know, we hired two researchers and clearance folks. Uh, so we had to be creative about what, how are we going to actualize uh, not just the religious dimension, but the broader narrative story of her life. Um, so we, we found footage from um, archival footage from Georgia and North Carolina that really showed uh, the, the prejudice and the, um, you know, the racism, the prejudice against Catholics, against Jews. Uh, against people of color, you know, so we we wanted to actualize that environment that she was writing in so people could feel it. And the tragedy of today is that it's just as relevant, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, the film itself is a creation of a lot of different media that come together. Um, you, what made you decide to, well, how did you, how did you decide on the cartoons the music, the, the the putting this all together. What what kind of a job is that to kind of come to this um, this artistic picture of of what the film has to be? I think well, you should, yeah. yeah, Elizabeth, Thanks. do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, that that really was part of the fun, and um, we uh, because we were so limited on footage of O'Connor herself. Uh, Pretty immediately, we wanted to excerpt her fiction, and we're the first documentary to have the rights to do that, uh, to include excerpts from her stories. And because the trust did not want us to do dramatic reenactments with actors, uh, <laughs> but they agreed to allow voiceover reenactments and motion graphics. I'm not sure if the trust knew what we meant by motion graphics, but you know, we we took O'Connor's. Um, you know, O'Connor, the cartoonist, that is a starting point and hired uh, three, really four great animators to uh, to do um, animated illus and illustrations that went with her fiction as well as, um, as text. We animated text and then with music, um, just found this great composer who's in LA, Miriam Cutler. She's done RBG. She's done a lot of great documentary work. I was delighted that she would come in for this. And I love doing archival research on music too. So found, found music that O'Connor references both in her stories as well as music that 
is from the region and from from the air. Yeah, terrific. Mark, anything to add? Yeah, I agree. I, I um, it's, you know, this is a new project. I mean, I, I I'm like the little geek who sits in his office and tries to write papers and write a book on Flynn O'Connor. So um, I was really pulled into the world of documentary film with by Elizabeth and her and her partner Ted. Um, and so it was really kind of fun to to, to have Elizabeth. I like Elizabeth kind of knew what she wanted to do, but she, and she was going to do it anyway. But she was always like, "Well, Mark, how about we do animation?" <laughs> I was like, sure, let me see some. Mark, what about this music? You know. So again, it was um, I had to really kind of, tr and I did trust completely. I had to trust the fact that this is a collaboration, and um, and what I could bring to the story, uh, to the film, uh, um, and what she could, what Elizabeth could bring to the film were two very uh, important things. Uh, so I learned a lot, especially about archival footage. I learned a lot about um, the, the ways in which you can tell a story through animation. And, I, and, I, and I'm glad we had two, in terms of stories, I'm glad we had two different animators. One for that one story called A Good Man That's Hard to Find that everybody knows, trying to make it bright and almost kind of almost a, a, almost a caricature grotesquery of, of it because I think that's how we, we talk about it. And then the other one uh, it was the others were just as, as as beautiful in a more sedated way or more subdued subdued way. Yeah. Well, Flannery was a cartoonist, and yeah, exactly. uh, that's how she started. And so yeah. this seems to be the all the permission you need to, <laughs> to to do this. And Mark, you know, you didn't you don't give yourself enough credit, but I would ask you questions like, what kind of illustrations do you think? Can you give me show me an example of an illustrator who you think really illustrates O'Connor's aesthetic? And uh, you found Natalie Barahona. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah. and we wound up hiring her. And um, yeah. I found Kathleen Judge and Heidi Kumau. Heidi Heidi Kumau really did uh, some great illustrations and animations of um, O'Connor's body herself, the great white outline of O'Connor walking okay. on crutches. Yeah. And then um, Matt Rappaport, who's a friend in Chicago, did um, some animated text and figured out how to do some interesting choices there. You mentioned the the grotesque, uh, and lots of people think of Flannery as gothic or as a writer of the grotesque and so on. Talk a little bit about that. I'm, I know our most of our viewers have probably seen the, um, the, the, the documentary. That's probably why they're following us. Hope they've seen it. Uh, if they haven't, they should see it. But, well, but uh, what talk about the grotesque a little bit? Yeah, well, Anita, I, just to your first point, I mean, one of the things that we did is, is, is we were invited to different universities, mostly Jesuit universities like Fordham and Loyola New Orleans and Loyola Chicago. Um, we we called all the alum, the Georgetown alumni of those cities, and said, "Come to the film, come to the film." So we always had a nice little uh, alumni group. Uh, uh, to to really talk about the film, uh, especially uh, afterwards, and, and, and celebrate its making. So, so to your point about the grotesque, you know, O'Connor um, O'Connor understood the grotesque as a way to magnify something that was real, and part of real life, but that we we tend to to um, uh, cover or you know make light of. And she almost magnifies these things. So it's whether it's the human body. With 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 one legged uh, a woman who's lost her leg or a man who's lost his arm um, or the kind of the ways in which she talks about the faces of people she it's, it's, she's this observer who who reminds her readers that this is what the human you know human family's like um, and of course the grotesque is that kind of sense of of the shock of of a revelation happening in the most uh, strange uh, moments and and again I think. The Southern Gothic is a, is a, is a, has been kind of used or, or become a discourse about you know how how different the South is or how it's it's primitive and how it's you know again these are all constructions mostly by um, an, a white elite from the North but um, <laughs> but but O'Connor but O'Connor took that on and said yeah you know we one of her great lines you know we can still we still recognize you know. Um, uh, grotesque. We still recognize evil. We still recognize a hauntedness about religion. We recognize this. So, so the, the grotesques are are basically kind of making those kind of front and center as she tells a story. I, that's how I see it. I, Elizabeth, you probably have about the other thoughts. I don't know. Well, and I certainly had the grotesque in mind when I was doing archival research. Yeah. And Mark, you may have had a, a moment or two of hesitation at some of the archival stuff. 
uh, that I put in. Um, but I think now you see, I, I mean, this is kind of a funny anecdote for the audience. The, the one archival um, film that shows the mother throwing knives at her daughter. <laughs> the nuns are sitting behind, or standing behind her, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I know you had some hesitation about that one at first, but I got that, um, the person who told me about that film is Rick Pralinger, who is the creator, founder of archive.org, the, the enormous website. And I was with him at a conference and uh, I went up to him at a visible evidence conference and I, I said, Rick, I'm doing something on Flannery O'Connor and you know, she had some issues with her mother. Can you think of any archival footage that might go? <laughs> He's not a man of many words. He just said, mother knife throwing Texas. <laughs> and I Googled it on archive.org and that was it, it came up. And then it's at the National Archives. So we, uh, the our archival research helped us find it and get a good copy of it. And that's how it, it wind up. But it's thanks to Rick Pralinger that we've got that great grotesque archival footage. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of is trying to capture the O'Connor sense of the grotesque and the humorous, right? And, and O'Connor was a great observer. So she once said that she she met her Ruby Turpin on an elevator, right? Uh, a woman who was just you know really pleased with herself, and um, she says she she she, she met uh, almost all the characters in um, that are on the on her farm are some of the farm hands, her mother, um, and so a lot of that she she can hear and uh, their dialogue, and, and she can see them, and it's just that a lot of that's just really from her own experience. Yeah. Well, you, your film teaches us how these stories really came together. They came together pretty much like your, your own film comes together. So, and you're both teachers. Uh, and I, I want you to talk a bit about the students today. How do they hear or how do they, what do they think about Flannery when they read her? Do they get into it? Do they get it? it, it have we become, has our, um, has, has our public art and media have they become so grotesque that actually flannery is not so surprising anymore <laughs> you know do they see worse quote unquote on tv now and on in, in movies and do they get the the whole the whole thing but but mo but but talk about your students for sure. a bit. i can start uh there I, you know since i've come to georgetown i've gotten to teach two um seminars on flannery o'connor and, you know, uh, Georgetown students are, uh, you know, a personality, you know, they're, they're, they're very bright. I would throw everything at them and they would read it. I was just, it was in, incredible. Um, uh, we read 12, well, 14 short stories. We read two novels. We read all of the habit of being her letters. We read uh, her essays. We read rev her reviews. I mean, everything we did. And so, um, I think people were intrigued by this person, right? This whole time. Um, why would we just go into one? Why would we have a whole class with one, just taking one author, you know? And, um, but as we went through it, I think they, they, they did begin to kind of understand her aesthetic and, the, and, the, and what violence is about. They had to negotiate uh, race. Uh, and we had to talk about that usually in our first class because the N word is, is she parrots that, the, that voice of the racist Southerner in her, in her uh, stories. Um, and so we had to, how do we want to, if we're going to read out loud, how do we want to talk about it? And it was, there's some really good conversations with the students just trying to figure out how they want to negotiate uh, that. Um, but I do think that students kind of like, it's like, it's like maybe the fourth or fifth story that they're like, aha. You know, and they they, they, got, they they they're on the scent to a Flannery O'Connor you know narrative. They're looking. I remember one student saying to me, um, "Oh, nobody died." <laughs> kind of like sad, you know, because <laughs> there's always some kind of violence there. So, um, so that that's part of it. And I think that the other thing is, um, obviously, Georgetown is a Catholic school. We and and I'm a Jesuit priest. I'm going to go pretty heavy on the religious imagination in, Cap in Flannery O'Connor and and how she talks about Catholicism. And, and, and beyond a doubt, um, in the courses, students, students feel a kind of intellectual kind of energy around, oh, she talks about Catholicism in a way that I can understand, not as dogma, but as she's, 
and so we talk a little bit about that and we unpack. So it's been a real it's been a real pleasure. Uh, and of course, in the four years, I'm always showing them little clips that that Elizabeth had. Here's a new here's a new you know uh, a new draft of the film or something like that. You know. Uh, version so I might show five minutes of it so they actually were kind of on the journey with me as much as the alumni have been they were kind of on the journey of these four years of getting this film shown uh and, and finished yeah, terrific I want to say one last one last thing I'm sorry Michael sure, sure the kids have to do a project at the end of the year because I, I they've been writing for me a lot and I want to say that um a lot of the projects have been a lot of fun so people who, who might be in the fine arts but are taking the class did this wonderful like peacock molded sculpted peacock um people did flannery o'connor came to georgetown to speak uh and uh, uh and it's 175th anniversary all these research projects of going into the lao library trying to find these things so i learned a lot from them as they did their investigation so i just wanted to say that as well it's sorry good. it's right she was at georgetown yeah yeah i i just was going to add for my for my film students um we talk about the project a little differently but one thing that's really helpful for them to hear is uh, we were dealing uh, our goal was always PBS public broadcasting for a national audience and that means a national interfaith audience a secular audience uh, you know it was never um, our our goal as she says uh, as O'Connor says you know she's writing for the people who don't believe in God and you know we wanted pbs <laughs> we wanted a film that could reach all of those audiences and i really think that that's the power of o'connor's writing too is um yeah. <laughs> to create converts <laughs> whether they know it or not um but uh i think her the her craft the power of her craft the power of her personal story i hope that we've started to capture uh from her her being differently abled, walking on with crutches and dealing with lupus to um, uh, to even, let's say, even the contention. My students will always bring up the recent contention about the question of her personal beliefs in uh, our racism. Uh, what does that mean? Um, how is your film? How did your film deal with this research? And um, and and to dig into that so i am happy to show them uh the research and the arguments around um o'connor's use of the n-word how that was played how does that play on pbs that's a loaded and should be question and that's why we had warnings before the film that uh the use of language um you know may negatively affect people and they may not choose to listen to it because of that we absolutely get that uh as well as uh O'Connor's um, parodic sense of humor that does not come off very well all the time or is aged very well always, but is understandable when you read her context. And then when you read her fiction, it's her fiction that that makes it clear how she felt about these questions of, of, of yeah. prejudice and oppression yeah. and, um, and grotesque behaviors. You, know, you do such a beautiful job of capturing the 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 country the way we were in the 50s especially after the war um, the way race was discussed and the way we lived with it the way um, black people lived with it the way white people lived with it and in the south where it was so so much more um, things were so much more segregated and and it was so much more structured the racism it wasn't so subtle at all it was pretty it was pretty overt and people took it as just the way life is. And I think that's probably really um, important for students to understand. This comes out of a particular cultural time, mm -hmm. but the messages are really universal. Mm -hmm. the, the messages go way beyond, it's terrific. Yeah, um, you know, to your point, I think, I think what students, at least my students, She's more about uh, exposing the, the presumptions of our whiteness, the, the, the privilege of our, of our status and classes as, as, as white folk, you know, as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to really kind of dealing with, with, with race head on. It's always as, as you just presume that you are the master of others because you're white. And so in you, if you don't do it in the, you do it in the story by, by reading it, but then you, she asks you to kind of think what kind of, 
what kind of assumptions and presumptions do I make about my own life where I'm not in, engaged uh, with those who are other than I am? Yeah. Particularly when you have an elite college education and you think you know so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think she's more relevant today on the race question than yeah. um, than people realize because it is how do you point to white what is white supremacy that's been ingrained in the white consciousness and that's what her subject is in so yeah. many of the stories. The other thing that's really interesting to talk a little bit about this is um, religious fanaticism and religious fervor um, because because we don't understand those people in today's culture. Mm -hmm. We're so secularized. So in the South, they're, they're, they're quote unquote normal. They're there all the time, especially in her South. Talk about this, what you discovered with this religious fanaticism. I call it fanaticism. Maybe that's the wrong word. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Elizabeth. You start. I was just going to say, this was part of our fun collaboration, too. I was uh, going to throw in the word Protestants there. <laughs> and evangelicals as well too and um you know i was raised in the south as a protestant i'm a sister who's a presbyterian minister and uh and so uh mark and i would often have sort of fun conversations about the catholic protestant stuff going on in o'connor's work um and you know the the, the real tensions and let me just say within pro the protestant denominations to this day right around gay and lesbian issues around you know it's in the catholic church as well um so you know these these questions we we may have or think we may have sort of evolved past the the race question now we're into uh sexual orientation gender trans um but we they still i think i mean your question's really about the the sort of fanaticism that o'connor uh makes fun of um um but it's that religious commitment that it's so American. I think it's the founding of America, that sort of fanaticism. And and from the very beginning of the founding of America, we've had a sort of uh, religious fanaticism that um, some people actualize in different in different ways, and that O'Connor certainly um, I grabbed a hold of for narrative purposes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I mean, I think O'Connor understood that um, the, the the kind of founding narrative of the, co the colonial world was basically radical Protestantism, right? They were so radical, they had to leave England, right? The, the whole pilgrims thing. So there is that sense of a kind of witness, uh, bearing witness to that Jesus saves me. And I think O'Connor both loved uh, and, 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 and critiqued it at the same time. I mean, she, she, had, she didn't have to go far to kind of create these kind of like uh, these, these folks, right? They were out there. However, I think she had, what she admired about them is that they felt the burden or the weight of a kind of salvation over them, as opposed to a, a kind of a, a secular 20th century that that didn't even didn't feel that at all. You know, so she said, you know, the South is not Christ centered, but it's certainly Christ haunted, and that haunting is part of the uh, is the part of that she tries to investigate. So her Protestant characters, especially those evangelical, those um, you know, whether it's in the river when when uh, Bevel goes down to get, you know, dunked into the water um, or it's uh, the two Church of God, you know, preacher boys who are taking the Joanne and Suzanne out for the Temple of the Holy Ghost. These characters, um, she, I think she she both wants to kind of um, hold them up. It's like, you know, this is their life. You know, religion is life down in the South. However, she critiques it at the same time by saying that it's, it's almost so... Um, it's almost pushed uh, into a grotesquerie. And again, it's exposing the kind of the grotesquerie of it. And so, you know, O'Connor, she's the Thomist, right? She, it's, it's faith and reason. It's a, it's a, it's a, faith is a kind of reason in her, in her world. So, so she's, she's a very different kind of character in the South herself. So I do think that she's, she's very much trying to expose the ways in which um, not only the, the, the assumptions of a kind of evangelical witness is the way that we understand religion in the United States. Um, watch out if that's true, right? She's basically saying a lot in her stories. I mean, you, that's exactly what's going on with, with um, uh, Hazel Motes in some ways. Um, at the same time, she's offering these dark moments, these mysterious moments, these breakdowns, 
these um, these existential kinds of questions that kind of uh, open it up, you know, uh, kind of uh, open up the story beyond fanaticism be and beyond Protestant and Catholic. It's just this kind of this place where we like, oh, you know, if there's a God, I can't kill someone, you know? Oh yeah, that makes sense having finished the story, you know? Um, at the same time, she can say, if you have a gun pointed at your head all the time, you're gonna live a different kind of life, right? Then not. So I'm not sure we're answering your question really good, Father Mike, but that- <laughs> No, no, you're, you're exploring all this, because I think, uh, isn't this kind of relevant today for for us today? Like, is is the South still Christ haunted, or is the country haunted by something? Uh, I know. Have we passed this moment of 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 the Christian culture? I would think O'Connor wouldn't recognize the evangelicalism anymore. That might be, you know, what you would say strident. When she said that it was Christ haunted, I think she saw that being dismantled before her very eyes too. I, I, that's how I think. Um, I think that uh, um, we're not so much Christ haunted. We might be, we might be God haunted maybe, but um, it's not the drama uh, of, the Christ, of the story of Christ I think anymore. Maybe I'm being pessimistic, but um, I, I think O'Connor would, would probably have a different kind of way to articulate that if she had lived beyond 39 years of age. Yeah. Elizabeth, how does that sound to you? Well, I i mean, this is part of where I had not dug into O'Connor's work before making this film. And and as I did and read, you know, most of the rest of her work, um, you know, I felt she's so relevant today. And these, what she captures, just like the Isabel Wil Wilkerson uh, book on cast, you know, how we think in terms of horizontal violence and um yeah. you know the the ways we're not just talking about race or you know or class or or religious backgrounds these these issues um cross over with each other and she does that i think better than uh, than other writers do and in terms of I mean, what she holds out so clearly and what makes her interesting is we know she had a Thomas rational, religious, personal background. And what she portrays in her fiction is often not rational. It seems on one hand, she's got characters who may have this commitment to Christianity, but then behave in very grotesque or irrational ways. And how, and this seems really American right now, how can people claim to have a kind of hold or attachment to a faith and then behave in ways that are grotesque that cause violence to other people. How can people keep those two thoughts in their head at the same time? Well, Americans do it all the time. And that's, mm. we're sitting here being confronted with it right now, I think, and still working for ways to talk to each other, to talk across these these divides of class and education and and religion and race and we yeah. don't have to separate them out individually there yeah people don't separate them out individually yeah yeah very good um you know she was um there are certain people that she admired and that admired her like thomas merton we have we have friends that are real thomas merton fans uh, what what do you think the attraction was her mm. of Merton and Merton of her. What do you think was going on mm. there? So, and then, and then, is there anybody today, any writers today that are really interlocutors with Flannery? So, say something about about Merton, if you think. So, I, I mean, obviously, uh, and, and and we have to give credit to um, to uh, both Patrick Samway and to Paul Eli, actually, who who've done a lot of work on showing those kinds of both the their conversations or letters and their mutual admiration. I think there was a moment in the in, a, in the in the American Catholic uh, Church that there was an intellectual kind of moment that, that grew out of um, really the existential trauma of World War II and and Catholics kind of making it as a, as a, as as you might say have a place at the table of the intellectual debates and cultural debates. Merton, this you know the who is you know the goes to Columbia. Uh, kind of goes from playboy to to monk, you might say, um, uh, talks about 
the journey of faith as a kind of an American journey that's recast in kind of monastic garb. You know, it's it's this really interesting thing. And and his his book Seven Story Mountain was read by everybody. It kind of became a a, a pathway to understand how to be American and be Catholic and and and, and kind of the allure. I think O'Connor appreciated that, and O'Connor appreciated the way that. In order to be modern, Merton had to go medieval. And for O'Connor to be modern, she was going to take all that medieval theology, all the kinds of uh, uh, symbols, um, uh, metaphors of Catholic history, Catholic liturgy, and she was going to somehow, in a modern way, kind of recast it um, and, and, and have it um, hit, hit upon other uh, aspects of being modern to see what happens. And so I really think it's that medieval kind of quality of the Catholic faith that was kind of revealed all of a sudden, but as Neo Thomas started uh, writing, we had Neo Thomas talking about art, we had them talking about philosophy, theology, politics, um, and all of a sudden you have a monk and this amazing writer, artist, uh, novelist who was doing it too. Yeah. Elizabeth, anything? I'll just, I'll just add in a quick thought with, with Merton. I'm definitely not the expert on it, but for me, um, the Merton qualities with O'Connor connect to the environment and connect to the natural world. And yeah. if there's anything, I mean, and this is my partner, the cinematographer, Ted Harden's in here somewhere. Um, but we really tried to capture uh, at her house and looking at the pond and, and being how O'Connor was connected to the natural world herself. And that that was a spiritual connection for her. And I think in her in her fiction, absolutely her vivid metaphors used to describe, you know, the the sun, the, the is sun a like coming through the tree. Post. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yes. And um, so for me that that connects back to Merton. Yeah, I think you're right, Elizabeth. There's a kind of a the contemplative uh, observer of nature, of reality of the hours is very much part and parcel of both of their lives. And to, to that effect, I mean, O'Connor once called her such as, I live like a monk. I, I get up, I go to mass, I sure. do four hours, three hours of work, I eat, then you know, I pray, you know. So um, I think there's also that affinity just in, the, in their physical life as well. That's right, and, and, and both um, very much bound to the land that they yeah. lived on. Yeah. 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 I have a question here that came in from uh, an Alex, uh, Bluski, I think it is. Um, do you think O'Connor's fiction is specifically meant to comment on the South, or do you think she wanted to reflect modern America more broadly through the types of Southern characters that she knew well? Um, we've sort of been talking around that. Go right at it. Yeah, Alice, I really think that O'Connor had that kind of medieval mindset um, that St. Thomas said about our, a kind of a Catholic mindset that the concrete particular finite place thing object can both be concrete and place you somewhere but have universal significance right and so um, uh, this so it's a sacramental kind of imagination so yeah I think O'Connor even speaks about it in, in the one interview we have with her on film she says you know I write from where I write but I, it has universal significance. It's 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 to say something about the human condition, um, and I think O'Connor would say, by talking about your your the place you are, the South, in an adequate way, in a, in a in a in a way that's that's authentic, you actually are speaking about something much more than that. So I totally would agree with uh, you, Alex, that she's really her characters are in some ways types. She almost writes these perfect parables that of where our, our notions of, of, of things are, are turned upside down, um, but she does it through these real like particular characters or particular moments of the sun or particular rivers, uh, particular streets. So absolutely, I, I think that's a really important thing that she's not just a, a Southern writer, she's a writer for everybody. And that's why she's being read in France, in Spain, in England, in Ireland, um, she's been translated, and there's been conferences on O'Connor in those in those countries because they see something about her. Um, can I give? Can I say something here? From there's a a question here from Veronica Sales Reese. I love the. I have to read the first part of it because it's a compliment to you guys. Uh, <laughs> I love the film, 
and the different media that appears there. It's a great contribution to bringing Flannery O'Connor to the to to life. And so, congratulations. I'm curious about in what sense can we say that her Catholic her Catholicism uh, mm. appears in her fiction? For example, how can we see that in the river or in a good man is hard to find? You touched a little bit upon that too already. Right. Yeah. You know, it's a great question, and um, in some ways, I, I see uh, uh, the. the that O'Connor's Catholicism is a, is a, is about not so much are you a good or a bad character. She likes to she likes to poke fun at the goodness or the badness of a character. She's really more interested in are you saved or are you not saved. <laughs> she really doesn't care about the moral good. She cares about are you saved. You can be a terrible person uh, like that grandmother is until the last moment of her life. But <laughs> she's she's been saved. There's a moment of grace at the end. And I, so I think her Catholicism comes out not so much by some moral kind of uh, dimension of the story, although it's there. It's, it's through grace, the, these revelations of grace, these and sacramental violent encounters in which something is open, something is exposed. And that's what sacraments are. You go to a, a, a mass and you have this little water and you pour, pour that on someone's head something is exposed there. It's not just water, it's something magnificent happening, right? You're drawn in. Or we say that this bread and this wine is the body and blood of Christ and the sacraments. Something is revealed that's been concealed. Her stories are all about revealing something. Her last great story, Revelation, right, is really about how that sometimes happens in a violent way through strangulation and through books being thrown at you. Wake up. Wake up to a bigger horizon. Wake up you're not the center of the universe. Oh my God. You know, we you hear stories all the time. Oh, yes, I'm like that too. I'm not the, I'm not the master of my life. There's something greater. So I think that's where her Catholicism comes out. And she's so funny about it at the same time. Cartoonist. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'll add here in this uh Father Mike, this might get to your last question a little bit too. I mean, O'Connor very much was living and friends and mentored by members of the Catholic literary heritage that were, uh, you know, Caroline Gordon, Alan Tate, um, Robert Pinner. These people were her mentors at Iowa, uh, yeah. at Yaddo, uh, um, Robert Lowell, uh, people who were both struggling with Catholic belief, but also found um very much a kind of literary access to the to some of the universal goals that they were trying for in their fiction and so what you see happening at the iowa workshop not in the south but o'connor connects this push that she saw in caroline gordon's work in particular and understood was happening in gordon's own uh, theological background and commitment of interconnecting the regional, the the personal, the local, to um, to the spiritual and to the, the goals of humanity, right? Sure. Uh, and and she just, I, I think, in some really, it was great timing, and uh, she found some of the right teachers and editors and mentors. Uh, this goes to Sally Fitzgerald in particular, um, who understood how she O'Connor personally uh, interconnected those beliefs and those 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 thoughts. And then there was a movement, a very popular movement of of, of literary scholars and writers uh, doing that at the same time. Yeah. Elizabeth Bishop, the poet, um, at yeah. the time of Flannery's death, writes um, something that uh, Robert Giroux says Flannery would have loved to have heard herself. Uh, she says that critics who accuse her of exaggeration are quite wrong, I think. I lived in Florida for several years next to a flourishing Church of God, both white and black congregation, where every Wednesday night, Sister Mary and her husband spoke in tongues. After those Wednesday nights, nothing Flannery O'Connor ever wrote would seem at all exaggerated to me. <laughs> Yeah, Elizabeth Bishop. Yeah, yeah who, who was a good friend of O'Connor's. Yeah, you know, I think there is that. There's this sense that O'Connor is so relevant today because uh, 
she matches her gift of writing with with a purity uh, of heart. Uh, and if, if anything in the postmodern mind, uh, we, we, we just value authenticity. And it's really, you might not want to like O'Connor or agree with her, you know, you might think she's too violent, but there's something so authentic about the stories and that, that's what's puzzling. Why is it authentic to have these grotesqueries, these, these Church of God people speaking? It's like, why is this going to be the space where I'm going to understand my human condition? And she yeah, brings. Well, this is a good. It's and that's it's a good. Let me follow up with this uh, question from uh, Muhammad Akbar. How did O'Connor view or engage what other religions and faith and other faiths in her writing? Mm. Um, so it's also the issue of what what cuts across faiths that yeah. that are that are relevant and, and that are part of O'Connor's work. O'Connor, yeah, O'Connor was very aware that something was happening in her, the late in her life in the late fifties and sixties. Uh, uh, she was she had read uh, a Frenchman uh, from Lyon, La Fournier, who who was already talking about, and she had, she had even read De Lubac, who was already talking about. Uh, a Hinduism and on the one hand with Bigelba and with uh, Judaism uh, and, and Islam uh, with Fournier. So those people were writing in the 1930s and 40s being being translated. O'Connor, O'Connor, she, she did a voracious intellect and she was reading all this stuff. So she was aware that something was going to happen. And of course, she dies as Vatican II gets underway. You know, it's just kind of almost completing. Uh, and Vatican II would be that moment when the church was going to recognize interfaith uh, cooperation, collaboration, accompaniment as an, a, a powerful part of being a, a, a religious person in the 21st, 20th century. So she was very, and I think the last thing I'd say is because of her admiration, although she was critical of some things, of Pierre Tejard de Chardin, who really saw that there was a spirit moving through history, even scientific history, progress, that we were progressing somewhere. She saw convergence as an aim of Christianity, and she would probably, I'm, I'm maybe speaking for it, the aim of religious uh, spiritual journey, that is a convergence. She died at the age of you know, 39, um, so she didn't get to see that kind of play out. But it was there instinctively in her last stories, I think. I don't think she ever comments on it uh, you know, st straightforwardly, but she was, she was uh, reading uh, and writing about folks who were doing that kind of work, intellectual she admired. Elizabeth, anything, any thoughts? On well, that? I think in terms of sort of research about her life and and things that came up, you know, she was writing, she was coming into a kind of consciousness right after World War II. And she regularly read Life magazine and was affected by, uh, and, and we wanted to put this in the film too, definitely the Holocaust and Judaism yeah, right. um, and understanding with refugees coming in from Europe. Um, you know, the, the tensions that that caused in the um, Southern Christian South, as well as across the, uh, the country. So I, th I think we, we had a number of moments, both Temple of the Holy Ghost, you know, references um, um, to other faiths beyond Christianity that, uh, that for me personally, definitely showed yeah. how with interfaith consciousness and aware. And she was reading any existentialist. She, so she read Martin Buber, the great Jewish uh, thinker, uh, had really absorbed his work. She had read Carl Jung, uh, the great psychologist who was talking about the collective unconscious. Um, she was reading um, Kierkegaard. She was reading those, those religious existentialists who were trying to grapple with the meaning of life. Um, and she was finding ways to kind of play off of that and, and, and absorbing it. So she was definitely on a path, I think, to, to articulate that if she had lived. Yeah, yeah, uh, great. Uh, you know, we just got a few more minutes, and I wanted to maybe change just uh, the subject just a little bit here. Um, uh, we've had some of of her work produced on screen. Um, you've done a documentary of her on screen, but if you, if what do you think is the work or works that should be brought to the screen so that more people? Uh, can see them, more people can appreciate them. If you were, um, you know, 
if you had a lot of money and you were making millions of dollars, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know it costs a lot of money to do these things, but um, what should be brought to screen? Well, you see in our film the few things, um, not everything, but a few things that have already been adapted and brought to the right. screen in terms of her fiction. And, uh, you know, I, there are, thanks to all the support of uh, Georgetown alumni and lots of people out there, uh, there are a few new projects around O'Connor uh, in the works, including a biopic um, of her life, which I think the documentary has helped to inspire. Uh, so again, if anyone out there is interested in getting involved or knowing more, feel free to, to contact me about that. And uh, adapting her stories, you know, I, is it possible yeah. to pick one? Mark, do you want to take it? Well, I, I, I do think that um, her, I, to do a, a full length adapt, adaptation, you probably would have to add more, but I would say it's stories that inspire, that kind of walk the path of O'Connor stories. I mean, Parker's back seems like a fascinating one to me. Um, I would love, um, I would love to have, uh, to draw out Revelation. A good friend of ours, actually, um, uh, Karen Kuhnrod, is is thinking about this right now. She's 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 performing it. She's just done a fantastic job. She's already brought everything that rises must converge to the to the to the stage. Um, there is something dramatic uh, in almost. And almost liturgical about mo little moments in her stories that would would attend to a um, to, to film. My my biggest I've always wanted to do this, and Father Michael knows this. I've always wanted to take like my five top stories and have a group of characters meeting in a town, and each of the stories are going to be about thirty minutes long, and they keep on passing each other. So it's the same actors, it's the same characters, but whoever was like you know um, whoever. Uh, but Holga Joy Hopewell runs into um, uh, Julian uh, and from from uh, everything that rises must converge, and and the, and the story kind of then moves and follows these these characters just to kind of to show that this is just, this is this is this is a particular place, and we can get all these characters in there. It costs a lot of money, but uh, I'm not sure if that's ever possible. I think, I, think the series, I think the television series should be called Milledgeville. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and every week we meet some characters and we run into some others that we've already met. Well, yeah, I, like I, I, and the Handmaid's Tale. We can. I want to break, break in though, and I want to ask Kelly. I, I want all of the Georgetown alumni to know that O'Connor was wearing a Georgetown sweatshirt when she was in, in graduate school. Kelly, can you put that uh, photo on uh, the webinar? So O'Connor. I've been trying to work out. So there's trainers, Kleins, uh, and O'Connors who all would send their sons, that was the time, up to northern schools <clears throat> and or, or southern schools that are near the north, like and so that meant Pennsylvania and um, and DC, Maryland. Um, so we don't know where it's, but I've I've asked uh, I've asked the one of uh, Flannery's cousins if she could do some work. But here she is with in, in what maybe 1948, 49, I guess that would be, right? Um, uh, wearing a Georgetown sweatshirt, and and you know she's from the South, and so she's uh, she's got snow, and she's uh, uh, here in the home in Iowa City that she lived in. So I just wanted to show that real quick um, because I thought it was it, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways in which um, when I was teaching um, this at Georgetown over the last few years, every time I showed that photo, like oh my God, that's that's Jack the Bulldog, you know. So it's kind of a, a fun moment for us. And if she was here today, she'd be wearing she'd be wearing her wearing mask. mask. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm absolutely right. sure. That's right. Listen, thank you guys. Uh, thank oh. you guys very much for this talk. Oh, well, there's one more announcement. Well, I just want to let all of our viewers know if you didn't get a chance to see it on the on, on the night, it, it, it is playing on PBS American Master. So go to the web page and you can um, it's streaming, I think, for at least a month. Isn't that right, Elizabeth? Streaming free, yeah. It's streaming for free. You just click on the Flannery section. Go to it and you can watch it uh, on computer on a smart TV and uh, people have asked me in the emails oh I missed it but I wanted to see it so I just thought we may, we might say that as well or you can buy yeah. a DVD of the longer theatrical version which has different scenes in it um, <laughs> on Amazon <laughs> shameless you two are shameless plugging <laughs> this. but it's okay it's okay it's a good cause that's the right thing to plug thank you both very much happy Easter and uh, 
been nice. Thanks. Thanks, Father Michael. Thanks, Elizabeth. Happy Easter to you and happy Easter to all our, uh, our Georgetown alums. Thank you.